Space, the final frontier. These are the continuing voyages of the USS Making Tracks. G'day folks, how you going? Adam O'Brien here. And I am about to be joined by Mark Newbold, my co-host here on the show. And of course, our dear friend, Rob Wainford, one of the regulars here on Making Trek's Star Trek fan podcast. As we do a deep dive from the new Star Trek, talking a little bit about the new series, all the way as we do a deep, massive dive into Star Trek. That's what we do here, folks. So get your swimming clothes on, get ready, we're taking a dive. Make sure you check out Making Tricks, a Star Trek fan podcast by subscribing to Phantom Podcast Network at fpnet.podbean.com or your podcatcher of choice. Also, catch me on the web at The Little Mullet on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and, of course, Mark at Prefect underscore timing. We'll catch you out there in the frontier. All right, folks, welcome to Making Treks, a Star Trek fan podcast, brought to you by the kind, the amazing people. That is, of course, the co-founders, Kevin and Kyle, over at FPN, Phantom Podcast Network. But we are from all across the globe, from Australia. Myself, Adam O'Brien, I'm here, along with my dear co-pilots here tonight, in the bridge section of the USS Making Treks, the one, the only, Mark Newbolt in Birmingham, and, of course, Rob Wainfer in Wales. We'll start with you. Mark, how are you? I'm very well, keeping busy, can't complain, the Star Trek in the world, it's all good. Nice, and Rob, how are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm very well, thanks. Thanks for having me on the show, really looking forward to it. Nice. Yeah, obviously, Star Trek, very, very busy on... Uh, the uh, obviously streaming channel right now uh, a little bit different for us uh, whether in the UK Australia because we don't have obviously the same one as the US yeah here it's on uh, Netflix but um, we're starting to see it on Amazon Prime as well with uh, the Picard show heading there but still no sign of lower decks uh, Rob is it showing over there on uh, any streaming channels not um, not that I'm aware of um, but then I haven't been looking for it but no I don't think it is Nice. And uh, Mark, you haven't seen it in uh, Birmingham, have you? No, sadly not. It's uh, I've seen them. Magically, they appeared on my television. I don't know how. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, but for what I saw, it was very, very good. It was really for well worth seeking out, especially for next-gen DS9 Voyager era fans. It's completely, completely in that wheelhouse. Nice. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people really getting into it. Obviously, Kevin and Kyle... Uh, on Union, Fed have been talking about how much fun they are, and just that there's a bit of humour coming through. It's kind of, I think, almost heading towards that Star Wars detours sort of idea. It's poking a bit of fun and all, all the you know usual Star Trek, but doing it from outside the Enterprise, not doing it in with the same crews and stuff like that. Um, I think that's what we're getting the vibe of. Obviously, the other one we've got is Discovery coming out with um, season uh, three now. Uh, I haven't seen it, Rob. Uh, you've mentioned you haven't seen it, but um, Mark, uh, you've watched a couple of these episodes. What's the tone? What are we What are we seeing in these new shows? They've stepped it forward, as you know, best part of a thousand years. So that's that's a brave step. It's sort of a, a Voyager type step. But the big difference is, of course, Voyager. They knew that they were missing them. There was no sort of time dilation in that sense. And pretty soon, sort of halfway through Voyager, they made contact. And so they were sort of, even though it was supposed to take them seventy years to get home, they were in contact with home. So. The disparity here is that everybody they knew at home has been dead for sort of 800 years if they left 900 <laughs> years ago sort of thing so 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 they really are they're not just lost in space they're lost in time as well so but but what discovery has developed nicely with the crew with the characters you know, the personalities but uh first couple of three episodes were sort of setting the groundwork for, for this season but i've got to say i've just watched the fourth episode which is very very ds9 vibe it's it's a trill based episode um, and really did capture the the, the way DS9 and Next Gen used to sort of hop between the A story, the B story, you know, uh, different things happening in different places, but very character focused. Discovery's done that, and it can sometimes look into its own navel a little bit and be a bit weepy and emotional, overly emotional, I think, sometimes. This episode really hit the balance between the two. You know, you got the sense of the predicament they're in. 
you got why people were reacting the way they did. And the main story, again, because it was Trill, it had, I know Trill started off on Next Gen, but it's more of a DS9 thing. You know, it really did have that tone about it. It was a really, really good episode. So I've got to say, the first two or three to take it or leave it, this one was was a real, I'd put it in my sort of top three episodes of the whole show so far. Really good. Nice. Now, Rob, obviously you mentioned too that some of these um, episodes uh, of DS9 and probably heading in towards not Voyager so much, but probably Enterprise going back that step where they, they play with time quite a bit. But I, I see these new episodes of Discovery. I don't know if you're feeling the same, but it feels like they're sort of tagging on to the temporal Cold War idea. What do you reckon? Yeah, um, I I found that I, I did watch the first episode of, of season three, and I actually enjoyed that. Um, but it, I was getting more of a, um, a mishmash of sci-fi vibe from it mm. rather than like I felt like they were um, a bit lost, lo- as, as Mark said, lost in space and lost at sea um, because I felt it was... I was getting vibes of Blade Runner, Mass Effect, and you know things like Firefly more than mm. I did from Star Trek. And then I watched the second episode, and um, I have to be honest, I didn't enjoy the second episode as much as the first one. But having just heard what Mark said about Episode Four and the Trills, and maybe I should uh, maybe I should give her another chance. Yeah, same. Uh, only out, Mark, has there been anything with uh, Section Thirty One creeping up anywhere in between here yet? Not really, nothing other than the sort of, because obviously Giorgio is on there. Um, and, and, and the good thing about that is because she's there, you know stuff's going to kick off. I mean, she's in this episode and she's her, she's dialed back a bit. She's there, but she's dropping the sarcastic barbs. But you just know that she's waiting for the moment, whatever the moment might be, for her to make a, you know an opportunity of it. Um, but no, not really, no. Um, because at this time period, you know, there's barely a federation. You've seen the flag with six stars. There's hardly anything. There's, you know, Starfleet's because Starfleet in this time period is a bit like the Jedi. You know, twenty years after. <laughs> <laughs> it really is, isn't it? Now, what's interesting about that too is I think that they're sort of playing on that, they're extending the legacies uh, of those roles. You know, um, very convenient. But it, to- you know, but in but in this one, it's uh, you know the Federation is a lost ideal, you know, and they're striving to get it back. Nice. The issue I have, yeah, the issue I have with Discovery is, um, I I feel that the writers are going out of the way to make it so you don't actually like the characters. Now I know we had that kind. I know they tried to do that with the Eight Deep Space Nine, and that kind of failed because everybody liked the characters. So they, do you remember when Voyage don't like these characters? as much um and i don't know there's a bit of a barrier there for me as a as i don't know as a traditional trek fan to try and get over that yeah i think it's always i totally get that and i think that it's one of the things that roddenberry put in wasn't it you know people have evolved past arguments and they can they're more cultured and you know and you watch kirk and spock and mccoy hack it out generally with the triumvirate of characters that came up with the answer you know that they did and next gen, he wanted them to be more conciliatory and bureaucratic and all that sort of stuff. And of course, the greatest episodes were the you know, things like Best of Both Worlds, when everyone's pitted against everybody else. And, you know, you need the conflict. And, and DS9 took that darker turn. And I think they've tried to fudge your way around it in a sense by setting all those episodes when there's real conflict and, and, and grudges and niggles sort of before the original series. And in Picard, you know, you've had these these things happen, you know, uh, as the plot panned out in that series, they're just throwing the galaxy into a bit of a mess. And now we step another 900 years on and the galaxy is even more of a mess after the burn. And they're, they're always trying to find ways to um, circumvent the reasons why these people should get on by putting them in situations where they can't. And it always feels like a bit of a dodge to what Roddenberry wanted. But by the same token, you know, Star Trek Two. Roddenberry never liked the naval aspect, did he? You know, even though that's just <laughs> Star Trek to a T. So not everything he said was right. No, it's it's no. exactly right, isn't it? The fact that you know they've got to take little bits and pieces of those and sort of meld it together and become what they are. And I think you know, as you say, Roddenberry probably didn't like a lot of that stuff. Uh, particularly, we see the direction he went with TNG with less naval focus. But I think we sort of come back there with, particularly with. 
DS9 becoming more of a militarised version of um, Starfleet mm. and heading in those directions, don't you think, Rob? Yeah, definitely. Um, but then uh, I remember when DS9 came out and it was an uproar from Star Trek fans saying it wasn't Star Trek, um, yeah. you know. For a number of reasons, for the for the conflict and the, for, the, for the fact that they stayed in one place. So I mean, they were, you know, they were trying to change things back then, and, and look what happened. DS9 became um, uh, a lot of Star Trek fans' favourite of all the series, so including mine. So uh, I'm all for you know, if they if they try to change it, it works. Um, I'm yet to be convinced on Discovery, but but then saying that, you know, DS9. It didn't, personally for me, it didn't, it got better or started to get good from Series 3 onwards. Yeah. I think series two, you could see they were still trying to de- develop the characters and find their feet. And then um, as soon as they introduced more conflict, ironically, with the Dominion, in series, you know, to, is it towards the end of Series 3, then it became, yeah. uh, you know, it, it found a focus, shall we, you know, shall we say, and it became really good, and I'm hoping that's what will happen with Discovery. Mm. I think with DS9, as soon as as soon as he got to Explorers, and you got Jake and and, uh, and Cisco off in the in the ship, and they let him grow his goatee out, that was the one. That was the moment, wasn't it? It, it suddenly felt like, like <laughs> let the guy shave his head for goodness' sake, you know. And, and the fact <laughs> the fact that he was like that before he got in the show, you know, and that uh, Paramount made him actually, you know, have the look that he had in the season one or yeah. whatever it was to get him away from his TV character he was using at the time to make it look, oh, you know, the let, Hawk. Yeah. yeah, Hawk, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting, that, like you've said, Rob, it got uh, better around. Uh, for me, it was season four, uh, not just the inclusion of Worf, but really giving us a bit more of the, the Klingon culture. And it's not just from one angle of it. They looked at everything from the female angle. They look, also looked at it from some of the old characters coming back from the original uh, series, but also, you know, the the way the Batleth was used, everything right up to, obviously, um, you know, them being such uh, an addition to Starfleet that they were basically uh, right there with them the whole way through the, till Season 7. So... It's, I mean, we all know the great characters from that, but I think that's why people gravitate towards Deep Space Nine is because it's not just one selection of charismatic figures. They all are. But don't you think, though, back, back in the day, a show like Next Gen or DS9 or Voyager, you know, would have 26 for Next Gen and it dropped to 24, then 22, you know, but nevertheless, substantial amount of episodes to develop the characters, lay out the settings Every episode was 46 or 44 or 42 minutes as it shrunk as advertising got bigger and all that sort of stuff. But nevertheless, you know, you've got an episode of Discovery today was, what, the 24th episode ever of Discovery. Mm-hmm. I think you have 10, it's 10 episodes a season, isn't it, for Discovery? Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, that's a bit more than that, isn't it? It's about 12, 13, isn't it? But you know what I'm getting at? You know, we've, we've just about passed the amount of episodes that you had in season one of Next Gen and we're well into season three of Discovery and, and it's such a different world I don't know if people today would keep would hold the interest for 20 episodes of Discovery a year you know um, mm. or 20 episodes of Mandalorian for example if you want to make a comparison because you know I think our attention spans are so short you know to have an eight week burst of Mando or a 12 week burst of Discovery off the back of you know however many episodes of Lower Decks we had the excitement's there and the social media's there to keep it buzzing and, and there's enough to do that. But I think for literally six months of the year to have a season of Star Trek on for six months of the year wouldn't fly these days. But but to develop the characters, a show now wouldn't have the grace that especially Next Gen and DS9 had. You know, Next Gen found its feet. You know, it was season three when Michael Pillar came in was when it really found its feet. But, you know, it didn't become a culture buster until Best of Both Worlds, the summer of Best of Both Worlds. That was the real thing for next gen. For DS9, season three was when it really stepped up. But Way of the Warrior was when it really caught people's attention with with Worf coming over off the back of Generations. You know, a show now just wouldn't be given that time. And I wonder where, with something like Discovery, which is so beautifully made and, and you get the money's all up on the screen they've got a great cast and they love each other which comes across in the show but I just wonder if it, you know, back in the day it would have had the time to develop now it hasn't it can't be given the time to develop because it's just a different world yeah 
Do you think yeah. it? Do you think it's budget? Sorry, sorry, Adam. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Rob, do you think it's budget doing that sort of thing where they just don't have that sort of cash flow to um, warrant doing 23 episodes a season? No, I don't think so. I think um, I, th- I think it's it's the new, just the formula that these days that 10, 12 episodes is just right for a first season. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, they used to do these long episodes, uh, long 26 episodes to try and chase syndication back in the day. Mm. I think there was a magic yeah. mag- number that they used to get. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but let's be honest. I mean, even back, even back then, there was a lot. Uh, it's a very good point that you know had they had more episodes to develop the character. I mean, there were some filler episodes. Let's be honest. We yeah. got we got those those clip shows, and uh, you know, and the some episodes were, were were really bad in TNG. You know, but then you forget it because the whole overall series was good. Um, you know, let's not forget about Sub Rossa. Um, <laughs> 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 but, but yeah, but you're there was right. a shade to play now, Rob. There'd be a riot, wouldn't there? Oh, could you imagine? Could you imagine if if next week's Mandalorian episode was a clip show? <laughs> <laughs> They'd freak. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> Shows did it back then. They all did it back then, didn't they? Friends did it. I mean, the biggest show in the world, even they did it, didn't they? Mm. Yeah, SG Marvel three, wasn't it? I mean, every season there would be a clip. Stargate. There's a couple in Stargate. Like you yeah, look at the. Well, I did a rewatch. I think it was last year. Every season had about four clip shows where they would literally just <laughs> they would patch together maybe five minutes of film, and the rest of it was all just from hey, this happened two episodes ago. So, Rob, you bang on. Like, it's kind of a trope of, um, I suppose, well, I suppose soap operas do a lot, but not sci-fi as much, we thought. But, I mean, they used to do that in a lot of 80s TV shows too. A-Team, Knight Rider, uh, definitely on um, <laughs> Magnum. <laughs> yeah. The other thing as well is that um, I, you're right, Mac, about the, the short attention span as well. And I, I'm, as, I'm guilty about that as well, you know, so, I mean, it, it kind of helps sometimes look at your phone when you're watching an episode and you, and you yes. get lost, you get lost the way on, on the story, you know, and I've just watched, um, I've just finished watching Cobra Kai, the first two seasons, and I absolutely Same. love the, the, mm-hmm. the 30 minute episode format, I absolutely, I think it, it doesn't have, each episode doesn't have to say it's welcome and it's really punchy, it is, um, all the way through. <laughs> I, I really like the thirty-minute um, episodes. And, you know, I watched—I um, can't remember what it was last year—and there was episodes that were over an hour long, and I, and I was like, "Ah, oh, I'm enjoying it, but come on, wrap it up now." You know? I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I totally agree with Cobra Kai. Totally agree yeah. with Cobra Kai. I mean, apart from that, it's a Karate Kid was great from back in the day, and it's it's a, a brilliantly observed sequel. When you look at the footage they show from the film and they put a different spin on it from Johnny's point of view, not from, you know, and all these things, it's a brilliantly done show. But you're totally right. Half an hour, is the, that was always the preserve of sort of, four, you know, two camera sitcoms, wasn't it, you know, mm-hmm. for the half hour thing. But now, like you say, for a drama like Cobra Kai, and, you, and the great thing is, you can, I mean, how many episodes in the season? Eight, ten, something like that? Not many. Yeah, yeah. I think eight. You know, you can watch the whole thing in an afternoon. Um, I mean, we, we didn't. We... we dragged it out as long as we could. We've just got to the end of season two, and I think season three is in January. And I don't know if that would work for something like Star Trek or... But then Mando, you know, last week's episode... Oh, no, we're talking about Star Wars, sorry. <laughs> last week's episode of The Valerian, the first episode was like 54 minutes. And the next episode was about 35 minutes, you know. And it, it you know, the length of the story dictates the length of the episode, which I think is great, you know. If you've got a story you want to tell, it's like... We're really padding this one out. Let's do some long shots of the speeder bike going over a hill just to fill it out a bit. You know, Ludwig, do more music. You know, you, that's that's only going to irritate people. So you, I totally get that. You're right. Yeah, I think sometimes it works better being shorter. Mm, yeah. I, I've always been a fan of the 90-minute movie format as well. <laughs> yeah, Men in Black. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or any of those, those 80s action movies, they had to... Tell a story in such a short time, whether it's five or ten minutes to get, you know, the main juxtaposition out of the way and then get straight into it, the meat and potatoes. So, you know, you look at your two-hour 
30 movie now, and a lot of those have a lot more leisurely time to set things up, don't they? Yeah. 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 Yeah, and certain films can get away with it. I think something like, you know, Endgame and Infinity War, you know, they had so much stuff by that point to wrap up and so much plot and and so many things going on, and they'd so earned the time of you parking, parking your backside in the seat to watch it that I had no problem with Infinity War being sort of two, two hours 40 because it was one of those films, or, or, or even Endgame, you know, it was one of those films that it went by so quickly one, they could have made it a trilogy if they wanted to of, of hour and 90 and, and got another billion out of it if they wanted to. So hats off to them for doing it the way they did and being led by the story as opposed to the, the you know, the, purely the finances. But nevertheless, you know, that show or that film needed the time but 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 made such good use of the time, you forgave it for being Dances with Wolves and, you know. But mostly, you know, like I say, Men in Black was the one I always think of. That was barely 90 minutes, you know. And you look at it's like looking at music, isn't it? You get, you know, Maiden released a song that's 20 minutes long. Raining Blood by Slayer is 22 minutes long. You've got a whole album in the time it takes Maiden to play one song. It's just apples and oranges, isn't it? You know, different styles suit different things, and maybe that's what's going on here. I think you're right. I think there's um, some movies can get away with the, the length of the time. Um, there's a running joke with, with, my, with my friend where, um, you know, say, well, if we start watching the motion picture now, we'll be finished by Christmas. Um, you know, because... <laughs> Is that you know it, that it feels long because because yeah. of the I thought they were just showing off the special effects you know you'd have a, a couple of minutes of um, of beauty shots of the of the Enterprise or uh, you know a Nebula or something like that so it all depends on how fast how pace how well they do the pacing of the movie or the TV series as well as you say that Mandalorian episode the first episode I didn't realise it was that long and I really enjoyed that yeah. Yeah, for, probably, so, probably yeah. felt about 40 minutes. I didn't minutes. mind the long shots of the, of the vistas. It seemed to work, didn't it? Yeah, very much. I, I like I like it sometimes that they, to, they stop to take a breath, you know, to, just to catch your breath. Um, but there are there are as long as as long as the story is gripping and you you are um, you, you're getting soaked into the story. If if the if the story is dry, the whole thing is dry. Then you yeah. know, for me. I've never been able to get into 2001: Space Odyssey, you know, because I've never, I've, I've never subscribed to the story, never really got on board with it. So seeing the beauty shots go on for ages and ages, I, you know, I'm starting to look at my watch and see what <laughs> you're just showing off your, uh, <laughs> your, your artistic qualities. Now. But that's that's such a good point, Rob. So I'm, we're totally leaving poor old Adam out here. Sorry, mate. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. It's such a good point, though, because. I think motion picture of all the Trek films is is far more influenced by 2001 than it ever was by by the 66 to 69 TV series. It, it's way more of, of that, you know, because they knew they couldn't make it Star even though Star Wars is, was a huge part of Trek being relaunched on the big screen and the success and Black Hole and blah, blah, blah. We all know the stories. But, but you know, it, it, Trek was never going to be Star Wars. The closest Trek's ever really got to Star Wars was bits of into darkness when it, you know, JJ throwing ships around on Kronos and stuff. But, um, yeah. but you know, it, 2001 was, was such a visual marker for that film. I, I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of 2001. I appreciate it and enjoy it for what it was, but I did like, I did like the translation to Trek because Trek, and this kind of goes back to the start of our conversation really is Trek's such a broad church. I don't think even Roddenberry realized what a broad church Trek would become in terms of tone, in terms of plot, in terms of stories and characters, you know, you can you can do the humorous, you know, bada bing, bada boom type stuff in Trek. You can do Wrath of Khan, which is one of the great movies, period, let alone being a Trek or a sci-fi film. It's just one of the great movies. And, and, you know, and, and it covers, it can touch on all these tones and make them work. And when you get a great cast like the next-gen cast, who, and, and I think if you go back to sort of seasons four, five and six, especially, you're bouncing from a really deep, thoughtful episode. Then you've got a sort of an action oriented episode. Then, you, then you'll have something like the drumhead, which, or like Measure of a Man, when the courtroom stuff, when you, you, it really takes you back a step to think. And then they'll get something like, I don't know, Rascals, or, you know what I mean? Or they'll yeah. stick them in a Cowboy Western episode. And, and it works with these characters. And you can even have the same characters in consecutive episodes. One's the most dire, serious thing ever. The next one's complete data's day, dancing with the doctor, you know, just slapstick stuff. How they made that work is as much to do with the actors as it is to do with the writing. 
And I've got to say, I think Discovery's got a good cast in the sense that I think they've got people who can sort of mix up the tone if they want to, but I totally get what Rob's saying. They almost want you not to like them sometimes. They make it hard for you to go, I kind of get where you're coming from, but you're being a dick about it. You know, so <laughs> this, this fourth episode was very good, I've got to say. I do recommend it. It was very, very good. But going back to what you said, the Stanley Kubrick sort of put this benchmark movie out there, which i got to agree with you guys. Like, I appreciate what they did, appreciate what he was trying to sort of, well, I, to be honest, I'm with you, Rob, I don't get that story. It doesn't, it's, you know, I suppose, about creation of a new a new race, a new beings or whatever it is, but it's still, it's all very impressionistic. But the, the visuals, yes, we're, we're there. But um, I've got to say, they tried to copy it so much with the motion picture, the one thing they got right, at least they did Earth properly. If you watch Stanley Kubrick's <laughs> uh, movie... Earth doesn't look like Earth. It looks like Mon Calamari or something. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I've uh, watched it enough to notice. <laughs> Watch it next time you see it and, and you'll see what I mean. Like Because nobody had really taken a picture of what the Earth looks like from the atmosphere at that stage. True. Right? So they, yeah. they that was a guess. It's a pretty accurate guess. They were close, but no cigar. But I've got to say, you know, looking back on that now, and what they did, you could probably take the motion picture, cut a good 22, maybe even 25 minutes out of it with all of those shots. You'd have a pretty fast-paced little, um, you know, adventure film. I would forgive the motion picture, though, to a degree. And we're all referencing the same sort of thing, the, the beauty shot around the Enterprise with, you know, Kirk and Spock and uh, Kirk and Scotty and the, the, I think the security guard at the back trying to look like he's not there. You know, it's like, um, beautiful Jerry Goldsmith music playing. <laughs> I said in the podcast the other day, you know, that, that shot is, it's it's as much a, a sort of a spaceship porn shot as the camera lingering on Jamie Lee Curtis in Perfect. It's that kind of, let's look at the curves, you know. We're paying for this, we might as well use it, you know. And, and Luke has always made a thing of, of, of sort of a, not a direct dig, but it was more of a sort of a, a reference to it when he said, you know, you, you know, you get an establishing shot on the show, on the film, and you only need, you know, you do your map painting, you, you linger on it, move the camera a bit for three or four seconds, you've established the location and in you go. But then, of course, as technology moved forward, he had the opportunity to do things like he did in the special editions and the, C- and the, and the prequel trilogy that meant that you would show it for, you could show it for as long as you want because the, the details are incredible. Um, and so it's, it's swings and roundabouts, isn't it? The Enterprise is a character. Coming back to Trek, as we should. The Enterprise is, is a character, so to reintroduce us to that beautiful shit that, that made us fall in love with the show as much as anything else, you know, I kind of forgive him for that, but it is, it's definitely an indulgence, no doubt about it. Nice. Now we're going to do a bit of a deep dive, folks. New segment here on Making Treks, which is the Ship's Guide. So we're going to duck into checking out from the Engineer's Station what could be a very interesting chat. I'm going to pick a random starship, a random vessel, and we're going to chat about what makes it special. The one I'm going to pick today, for you, Rob, this is especially for you because you love Deep Space Nine, same with you, Mark, is, drum roll, please, is <laughs> Cisco's Bajoran Solar Sailor. Ooh, good choice. I was expecting you to say Eddie Fry, and then there you were. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So take it away, Rob. What what do you think about this vessel? What makes it special for you? It's a kit car. Um, you know, I'm, I've never... Yeah. People who are car enthusiasts, can you, um, to be able to build your own car, but build your own spaceship and take it out there, you know, and see all the wonders out there, and you built that, that's got to be that. That's what makes that special to me. I, I was so when I watched the episode, and you know, he was putting it together, and you know, I was like, "This is crazy." That in a you know, in the Trek universe, in a couple of hundred years' time, you would you would be able to build your own ship and just go out there and explore. That to me is um, that's what makes that so special. Definitely, Mark. What do you think about this vessel? I totally agree. It, it's the it's a Morgan, isn't it? Like you say, it's a kit car. It's it's something he's oh. done in his spare time. I mean, he was a tinkerer, wasn't he? You know, he, he was always doing stuff like this. didn't he? Wasn't he building clocks at one point, if I remember? You know, there was always something. There was seemed to be something on the go. So and he was a handy guy, uh, but that was obviously superseded by his responsibilities to a degree. But 
Yeah, and, and because we've mentioned that as the episode when he when he first gets the goatee with Jake. But, um, <laughs> um, and I haven't seen that episode for an age. I, I, I might just go back and, and revisit. But um, yeah, like you say, all the technology available to him is commander of a station. You know, season three, had they got defined by season three? I know it came in in season three. I can't remember whether they quite got defined by then, but but if not, it wasn't far away. Thomas so, Ryder. You know, but, you know yeah. Yeah, you know, you've got runabouts and all the other stuff that he's got available to him. And then, like you say, he's got all these Ferraris and he builds himself a Morris Miner sort of thing. <laughs> but it was, it was much about the bonding, really, wasn't it, with, with Jake in that episode. So, so it was a father and son. And I like the father and son episodes of DS9. It was, I think it was a healthy thing to show. Um, I mean, The Visitor is my favourite ever Star Trek episode, which is Jake and, and Ben. So, uh, you know, obviously attached to those. But yeah. Yeah, it was a cool ship as well. I think for the for the effects technology at the time, I think they were sort of pushing the boundaries to to be able to make it look something like. So it's quite a brave thing to try and do as well. And Count Dooku stole it. Oh yeah, it did it ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a cool ship, but it's a pig of an Egon Moss model. I've, I've had oh, to oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, it's very fragile, like the real thing. Oh, what I, what I like wow. is, uh, <laughs> you like you all the creep and the bangs and all the metal banging against each other, you know, that's what I liked about it. Yeah, so you got to send us some photos yeah. of that. Why not like to see that? But I also got to say, folks, not only did it influence, uh, obviously, the Attack of the Clones vessel, uh, this Genesian design that um, Lucas pretty much just lifted straight from Deep Space Nine, let's face it. Um, maybe even Tron, to some extent, maybe even got influenced by both, but... The other one was Kevin J. Anderson's Saga of Seven Sons, this um, uh, series of seven books that he did in the um, early to mid-2000s, had a race called the Ilderans, and the Ilderans actually used exactly this, although more of a sort of a um, taking that design and pushing it towards more of a 1800s-style vessel that had that same technology, but in space. So it's been referenced a number of times, but... It's interesting that I think the best rendition of it is right here, the Bajoran one. So, I, I don't know, guys. I think this is an amazing vehicle. One of the ones that, um, for me, in Star Trek, probably stands out more than the Defiant. There you go, dare I say. I think it's because... Yes. <laughs> it's debatable, isn't it? <laughs> I think it's because, because it's got that Bajoran... And also, storyline-wise as well, you know, Cisco's just coming as the Starfleet guy, as the outsider, he's pulling the crew together, he's got his liaison with Kira and all that sort of stuff. But, but you know, as it goes, and we know where it ends, you know, it becomes, you know, he's the emissary, but he takes him a long time to accept that and, and such. It's all part of the journey towards him being, not only accepting the Bajoran way of life and, and such, but almost for them accepting him. Not that he rides around in it like a hot rod or anything, but it's just, he makes it in that style he, you know, he could have picked any design he wanted to. I'm sure there was Earth Solar Sailors, you know, but he does a Bajora one. Um, it's all part of the, the tapestry of the show, I think, which is why people appreciate DS9 so much, because it layered up, layered up like a lattice cape over seven years, you know. It was just part of that lattice, wasn't it? Mm. I, going back to the solar the solar sail design of um, of the ship, um, I have just Googled this, so I am cheating. Because um, Nestle... <laughs> technology, haven't they? And they, um, yeah. In 2011, a NASA team embarked on the development of a technology demonstration mission known as the Solar Sail Demonstrator, which intended to prove the viability and value of using a huge, ultra-thin sail unfurling in space and using the pressure of sunlight itself to provide propellant-free transport. Star Trek was there first. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a there's an episode. I mean, I'm not a techie guy. I couldn't hope to to talk about the tech of any of this. But but you know, the the relationship between real world technology, NASA, obviously, and the Jet Propulsion Lab, and all that stuff. You know, there's their, their names all over the credits of of Roth of Khan. Uh, you know, and uh, and all the other elements of of real world tech compared to Trek tech and the overlap. I mean, there has been books written about it, hasn't there? So, um, you know, the thought that NASA either, either you know, somebody, because they have their advisors, don't they, on Trek, you know, somebody at NASA has said, well, we're hypothesizing this, we might be able to make it in 50 years' time, you know, and then the Trek guys sort of extrapolate out from the from the back of that. I mean, you go back to 2001, you know, 
the influences of 2001 have, have sort of made their way into all sorts of other areas of sci-fi, but but the tech of 2001 was very much inspired by the NASA guys pitching forward, you know, back in the mid-60s when Arthur C. Clarke and, and Kubrick were sort of really starting to work on 2001 because it was a journey to get to the film. Um, you know, they probably thought, oh, we'll have a man on the moon by, you know, we'll have a moon base by 1990 and we'll be on Mars by 2000. And, you know, th- they obviously thought we will be far further ahead than we are. We're, we're pathetically slow in that respect. <laughs> are we? it's, it's cripplingly slow. Compared to where, you know, compared to the White Brothers to the moon in sort of 50 odd years, in the last 50 years, what, we've not really done much other than the space shuttle. So, so and, and obviously Hubble, but that's not space travel. That's, that's a different thing in the International Space Station, which has been a ever developing project. But, but uh, yeah, I, I'm going to just say, uh, completely untrek related, this has just dropped into my head. Um, I wonder if Elon Musk has designed the Mandalorian's backpack because the way that landed in the latest episode was just like those rocket boosters coming down. Yeah. <laughs> it, just, it just made me smile. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a news article the other day. of um, Isn't there some kind of um, uh, rescue guy in the mountains? I can't remember if it's Wales or up in Yorkshire or wherever. Um, and he uses a backpack to go up the mountain now because it's quicker. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw, I did saw, saw that, Robbie, yeah, and I thought of you because it's. I think it's not a million miles from where you are. Not, not that anything is a million miles from where you are. That's really not nailing it down very well, is it? But, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, but you know, it, yeah, yeah. The the the, uh, the uh, sort of like the Bond style jetpack they showed. It was on BBC Breakfast. They showed him scooting up the side of a mountain, and uh, he can get to places on the mountain sides in sort of ten minutes, where it would take a helicopter forty minutes, and they'd have to rappel down, and he's just there. And then you can do first aid until they've got the time to airlift them out. But yeah, good old technology. Gotta love why it. Don't they call him, why don't they call him the mandolins? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. Please, can we? Got to wear a helmet. <laughs> now, we're going to be heading into the Starfleet Lounge, folks, where we have the library. And our librarian himself, Rob Wangford, is going to take us through it too. Amazing. Technical journals. Technical, let's just say, is the word because it's going to describe the universe of Star Trek. Take it away, buddy. Yeah, well, I, I, I dug out one of my favourite Star Trek books um, the other day and it brought back so many memories. And it's not actually a novel. It's The Nitpicker's Guide for Next Generation Trekkers. It's by Phil Farron. And uh, there are three books. There are two on The Next Generation, one on Deep Space Nine. And just to read the cover, the first book, six seasons, so obviously came out before season seven was available, six seasons of bloopers, flubs, technical screw-ups, and plot discrepancies for discriminating fans of Star Trek The Next Generation. And uh, I had this when The Next Generation was being shown on BBC Two for the first time, and I got a little mark in... In, on the table of contents of each episode that I've recorded on VHS. But what I like about it, and this is so traditional Trek for me as a Star Trek fan, because it is full of um, plot oversights and discrepancies. Um, and I'll give you an example. So if we look at um, the first episode, which is obviously the pilot, which is um, encounter at Farpoint. If I go to the continuity and production problems, this is the kind of thing that you'll get from this book. And as a Star Trek fan, I love it. So here you go. Um, at one equipment oddities. At one point, the computer on board the Enterprise gives Riker directions to a holodeck. As he walks down the last hall before the holodeck entrance, the computer tells him that the entrance is the next hatchway on the, on his right. Riker spins around, goes left. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. If you're not a Star Trek Next Generation, who's not, who's not going to like that book? I mean, it's, honestly, it's a thick book. There's over, how many pages? You know, there's over 400 pages of useless information like that for each episode, and I love it. <laughs> so that's my recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> nice I haven't read those books forever it's, it's been donkeys and I think I must be like you Rob I'm pretty much I'm pretty confident I would have got those at 
pretty much the same time when the show was coming out. Because, I, yeah, I, I think now, looking back, and it's the beauty of the retcon, isn't it? But you can't retcon turning left instead of turning right. I mean, unless they can just make holodecks out of thin air, which I suppose technically a holodeck could. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, there's no getting around that one, is there? <laughs> I don't know whether the editor at the time flipped the, the image. It could have been that he did actually turn right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Look for the Delta Shield. That'll give it away. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to say, too, I mean, these, these books that came out, not just the, those, but also some of the guides to uh, the in-universe guides, it really gave you a chance to dive in as a fan, as if you're in that neighbourhood itself, in the, the Star Trek un, uh, universe. Um I mean, you know, there, we know there's so many different manuals as well that mm. uh, have come out over the years. Um, Mark, what are some of the ones that you've enjoyed? Oh, blimey. I mean, in the universe, it's fascinating, obviously, but that, that you know, next-gen technical manual, I remember very fondly. I picked it up at my very first convention in 92 uh, when they first showed the trailer for DS9 when it still had the next-gen font on it. Um, it was the first convention, I think it was the first official UK convention held after Roddenberry passed away. And Will Wheaton was supposed to be there. He broke his ankle skateboarding and it got the biggest cheer of the weekend. Um, and uh, it's back in the day when they used to bring videos over from the States. So we saw The Perfect Mate, which had just been shown in the States and somebody had brought it over on the plane uh, the following day and we saw that, um, which was rather cool because I know we were certainly the first people in the UK to see that episode, which was good. But um, yeah, Next Gen Technical Manual was fascinating uh equally the ds9 technical manual so they're great but i do enjoy the some of the behind the scenes books you know making a star trek um the um any of those sort of biographies the actors biographies are fascinating as well shatner's done some really good i know he gets a lot of stick but shatner's done some great well, star trek movie memories and star trek memories highly recommended get a life is fantastic um both brilliant books um, but but all the cast, most of the cast had done books. Obviously, Nimoy had done a couple. I am not Spark and I am Spark and, and all that stuff. So I find them fascinating because I think with Trek uniquely to almost any other franchise, uh, okay, you know, Carrie Fisher will always be Princess Leia. Mark Hamill will always be Luke Skywalker. But, but you watch especially original series Trek and they're so closely identified with their characters, you know, in a way that other sci-fi and even other movie people aren't. And the things they saw, you know, those first conventions in the 70s, naming the, the, the shuttle Enterprise and all these things, I just think it's uniquely fascinating and nobody else had experiences like that. So that's the sort of stuff I like. Nice. Well, I've got to say, for me, here in the library, I'm going to bring up a book that um, I go back to as somebody that was, you know, as a trained artist, I went to, you know, college to study as an illustrator and uh, later as a web designer, a graphic designer. The things that I enjoyed going through were basically concept art books and, and even just um, stuff on uh, creation, uh, creature designs and uh, makeups and stuff like that. One of those is The Art of Star Trek done by Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens. Obviously, they're the collaborators on a lot of the um, uh, Shatner books uh, that we've come to enjoy over the years. But what is good about this is not only do you get their commentary on it, you get some really interesting concept art that I haven't seen out there before uh, when I picked this up. Everything from all the TV series right through into Next Gen and obviously right through the movies as well. Uh, and as mentioned, you can see things like the Bajoran designs and stuff like that too. So uh, it's interesting how many artists come through this too. Have you seen some of these books, Rob? Yeah, they've always been... They've, they've always been uh, something which I, I like looking at um, I mean, back in the day, I would stare at the images in these books for for ages, you know, Star Wars books, Star Trek books, especially the concept art. Uh, these days, if we go back to, you know, with the <laughs> my attention span, um, these, the, these books are <laughs> worth it for me because there's more pictures than there are words. So, you, you know, I've got an excuse to just stare at the pictures. Let's be honest, we buy a magazine from the, from the news agents. And you you skim for it first, just looking at the, at the pictures. And these are a Star a Star Trek books. Um, they're perfect for that. They're so good. And you say when you when you see some of the some of the artwork, some of the concept drawings. And back in the day when I was when I was younger, my imagination would run so much, create my own stories by looking at some of the concept artwork. 
especially this, you know, back in the 70s and 80s with the Star Wars and the Rock and Quarry pictures. Oh, without a doubt. And I think it just lets our imaginations run, doesn't it? I mean, there's so many different oh. designs. In. This one in particular has the Ralph Macquarie Enterprise in it. Uh, I think you guys know that one pretty well, eh, Mark? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, getting Macquarie involved in, Tre in Trek was a, kind of a masterstroke because he was the go-to guy after, obviously, he'd done the stuff for NASA and, you know, and done other, other little noodles before Star Wars, but obviously Star Wars put him on the map and then Close Encounters and, you know, his influence... Is, is far more to, to, the, to the general public wider than they probably realise, and, and of course this, you know, you, the, the, it's more of a star destroyer, <laughs> star destroyer enterprise. <laughs> than but you know, the, the silhouette of it, obviously, forty plus years later, influences Discovery. So, yeah, it's uh, it's quite impressive how how far reaching his his designs have, have gone over the years outside of Star Wars, which obviously everybody knows about. Without a doubt. Uh, now, coming back full circle, guys, to obviously uh, our main conversation, we talk about discovery. But one of the things I think that brings back to, and it's something that not only we've been talking about here, but just some friends of mine have been talking about, it's made them want to go back and look at some of the earlier seasons of Enterprise, before the Zindi campaign. And, of course, when uh, Jonathan Archer was facing the temporal discord and of course these weird things that were happening in the timeline i think back then they didn't have the time to really explore those as much but um want to get your feelings on this guys so rob when that came out obviously they're playing with time again like they've done a number of times in star trek do you think it was an interesting idea to have this sort of cold war uh, war sort of espionage thing running through the timelines Yes, yes, uh, yes, and no. I mean, I've always been a big fan of um, standalone episodes, but yes, I, I thought they, it was just a shame they only had four seasons. It was just getting good. Uh, well, it wasn't just getting good. I mean, I, I, I got to be honest. I enjoyed Enterprise from season one, but um, I, it just didn't. It needed another two or three seasons to, you know, to be able to develop that storyline. To be honest, and we just didn't get it, which is a shame. It is. Uh, now, Mark, obviously, they sort of left it, I think, in season one, and we didn't get much of it till uh, a little bit later. Uh, and obviously, we had a character from the um, the future come back, and we obviously had, in between his timeline and uh, that of Jonathan Archer, we had these sort of uh, people trying to really play with the timeline and um, using aliens to attack um, the Federation. But you look back on it, it's interesting Starfleet taking that on and uh, not really playing with time too much. What do you reckon? Yeah, and, and think about Trek, that, that it gets hit with a stick a little bit, and it shouldn't because I think it's one of the tent poles of, of Star Trek. It's the whole time element, which is why it always confuses me why people get really you know twisted up about you know the Kelvin timeline when we've got the mirror universe and we've you know you had yesterday's Enterprise, which was its own thing, and you know, and all the other episodes that that sort of splintered off, uh, you know, into their own little, uh, I'm trying to think of the next gen episode now, uh, Future Imperfect, you know, things like that. You know, Trek's always played with time and it's worked. And then Enterprise comes along, which I totally agree with Rob. I mean, it was, I thought, I enjoyed seasons one and two, but by that point, even by that point in sort of 2001, 2002, was wise enough to know it's Star Trek. It needs a couple of years to get his feet. You know, so you gave it that. And then season three, you know, um, was, was again, with this, the whole Zindi arc was fantastic. And season four, doing those little three and four parters was like, this is really starting to cook now. And then they cancelled it just when Money Koto came in. They, they cancelled it. It was so frustrating. But I think, yeah, it, it's such a tenant of Star Trek now, time travel. That really could have been interesting. And, and you know, you had, I mean, DS9 kind of joked about it in Trials and Tribulations, you know, the... the, the the, you know, the temporal department, you know, Dolma and Luxley and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, they could have done, if they'd wanted to, they could have done something with that. And it, it may be, you know, not to the degree of, okay, Trials and Tribulations was a loving tribute, the 30th anniversary tribute to, to the show. Um, and, and it was done for a reason beyond the story, if that makes sense. You know, they wanted to do, you know, they got the tech to do it and it still holds up really, really well. Um but, you know, I think there's definitely something in there they could do. And that's why I wonder why I get the feeling when they get to Section 31, above and beyond it just being that sort of, you know, the Federation's version of the Tal Shiar sort of thing. I think there could be some time travel elements. That's my gut feeling is where that might take. 
Does it, somehow Giorgio's got to get back to the regular inverted commas timeline. I would imagine, you know, unless they're really doubling down in, in this sort of, you know, 32nd century or, or wherever they are at the moment, it time period, I would imagine that with Strange New Worlds coming, you know, that's a classic, that's what it feels to me, that's going to be a classic standalone episode Star Trek show, you know, old school, you know, early next gen, original series, you know, episode in, five act story and out kind of vibe. That's how Strange New Worlds feels to me like it's going to be. Um, which was why Lower Decks works. You know, it, was a, it was a story of the week thing. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's definitely, there's something they do, or, or if they don't overtly follow it, it's certainly something they can pick up on and do more with. But yeah, Enterprise got a bad rub. It, it really does still. When did it get, I was in Vegas when they showed the last episode. They had a party at the Star Trek experience that me and my friend sneaked into and we left there at two in the morning, worse for wear. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, oh, oh, some stories on that night. But, but you know, <laughs> it was, it was, you know, even in the room, it was like, oh, yeah. and it was the end, it wasn't just the end of Enterprise, it was like Rise of Skywalker. It was the end of Star Trek on television for what was it, 18 years or whatever? 26 seasons, I think it was. You know, so it wasn't just, and of course, these are the voyages will always be debated, of course. Um, but um, yeah, it was, it deserved better, and there's definitely more stories to tell. Definitely. I, I, I thought the other day, I don't know if this is true or not, that when they cancelled Enterprise, I know they don't release their figures for Netflix and, and so forth, but um, I saw the other day that the, when they cancelled Enterprise, it had more viewing figures than currently what Discovery is, is getting. That would not surprise me. Really? That totally would not surprise me, yeah. Wow. View things in the States are so weird. I mean, you know, they get five or six million for a show and it's like a big hit. You know, and it's yeah. like, I mean, Hollyoaks gets that. <laughs> <laughs> because it's become so watered down with choice now. Yeah. So here, yeah, and that goes back to your that goes back to your point, though, Rob, about time, to, uh, like attention spans. You know, if I'm watching 26 episodes of Star Trek a, a year, I know I'm going to watch it because it's Trek and, and I'm hooked and invested. But we're the three of us are deeper level Trek fans than your general TV viewer that goes, "Oh, Star Trek, let's watch an episode of Star Trek." They might watch five or six and miss a couple. You know what I mean? Uh, because we know Stranger Things is coming, we know Cobra Kai is coming, we know Mandalorian is coming, we know blah, 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 blah. There's not enough time in your life to watch all the things that are new, let alone go back and revisit the things that you loved. So you mentioned going into a supermarket and flicking through a book and looking at the pictures. I know I've got books upstairs, comics and magazines that I've bought over the last 10 years, let's say. Nine out of 10 of them I read once. And if they're a comic, they're put in a Mylar bag and put away. But I've got comics from 30 years ago that were probably read 10 times. Because there's been such a proliferation of because of Next, it's Next Gen that did it really on the television. Because Next Gen was such a massive success that there's now so many TV shows that have continued and streaming has you know infinitely expanded that and franchises now come out and how many Trek shows are there now in the franchise like ten shows with more to come you know and all the other things and Prodigy coming with with Kate Mulgrew and all these things you know which will be great. Um, there's not enough time to revisit the things you love, let alone keep up with the stuff that's coming out. So, yeah, more hours in the day, please. <laughs> I think, I think it, the other thing as well, you had um, you, you invested um, a lot of time. You invested money and a lot of time into the uh, into the episodes as well. So, so back yeah. in the day, the next gen, I was paying thirteen ninety nine two for twenty five pound VHS yeah. tape. Yeah, sorry. With, yeah. Was it two episodes? I can't remember if it was two or three episodes. Yeah, it was two. It was two, yeah. 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 So if you spend that money on them, you are going to repeat watch them. You know, even even the bad yeah. episodes. But these days, it's very rare that you go back and repeat watch an episode of some of, of a series, even ones you like. Yeah. Because it's out there <laughs> to watch. Yeah. There's not enough time. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's a shame. It, it, there's almost too much stuff. You know, and I think I think ah. Uh, this podcast, I love doing this podcast. One, because I get to talk to you guys and it's fun. But the <laughs> two, I'm sort of dredging up in the nicest, that sounds horrible, dredging up. But you know what I mean? I'm, I'm recalling nuggets of knowledge and information that I would have read in Star Trek magazine or The Communicator or Starlog or whatever 20 plus years ago when the show was on. You know, DS9's been gone over 20 years. 
even you know even next year Voyager's been gone 20 years 2001 wasn't it you know oh, yeah. um, Enterprise is 15 years gone you know and, and next gen good god that was that's 26 years since next gen finished and we had generations um, it's you know and getting the poster mags that they used to do and, and all the things that we used to read back in the day that you wouldn't just read once because you hadn't got an internet to distract you we'd only got four channels on the telly you know there was no sky telly there was nothing else um, I would sit and read magazines repeatedly, you know, and that sort of knowledge would soak up. And but now, because like you're saying, there's so many new shows, and I, I love that. I pick Stranger Things and I love Stranger Things. I couldn't tell you the characters' names. Mm. I couldn't tell you much about the show. I've seen every episode, and I absolutely can't wait for season four. But it's very much a snack, whereas Trek and and Star Wars, you know, in a different way, because Star Wars is more of a movie thing. But but Star Wars is more of a feast. Because I know I'm going to deeper dive into that and track the same more older trek back then when there wasn't so much other stuff to distract me. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> trouble. Distract, distraction and attention spans, yeah, they've changed over the years. Yeah, yeah. So, so Rob, would you say to, like, if you had a chance uh, uh, to take something like, say, the ending of Enterprise? Now, we know that's not the ending that we wanted, and it's certainly not one that's wanted to be remembered. What would you do to wrap up that series so that it just had maybe a continuation even? Um, more, more exploration. Um, end end on, on them going out there and finding out what's out there because it was all new to them. You know, and that's what I liked about Enterprise. They were... They were discovering stuff for the first time that we were all used to. You know, what? Yeah. Oh, what's this? This is a Ferengi, um, you know, put the continuity to one side for a second. Um, you know, these are Ferengi and, um, you know, oh, we've just done Warp 5.2. Let's all have a party. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, it's like when you watch Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I really like that that movie or and the book because you were getting to see all the magical world and all the magic for the first time through the eyes of Harry Potter. By the end of Harry Potter books, you were kind of used to the magic. And that's what I liked about Enterprise, is that you, you were getting to see all this wonderful stuff for the first time. So to end it, just carry on with exploring what was out there. And then, you know, I, I personally think it would have made a great movie. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that, definitely. And, I, and one thing I liked about future Trek, the stuff, Trek stuff that came after Enterprise was it felt like they honoured the like Archer as a, as a character, you know, the, the Admiral Archer. You know, yeah. he had a history that we never saw, you know, uh, you know catching up to his dog getting beamed up and all that silly stuff in, in, in the Trek film. But you know what I mean? That, you know, you mm-hmm. got the sense that that Enterprise, okay, super, it precedes Kirk and, oh, and now Pike and Spock, which we're going to see in Strange New Worlds. But, you know, it, it, it had its own very distinct history. I don't see any reason, okay, we're 15 years past it, you know, you'd have to pick it up 15 years on, and they're not going to CG de-age them for, you know, for, <laughs> for forever. Nor should they. But, you know, I, I don't see any reason why they couldn't, because all the actors, correct me if I'm wrong, but all the actors are still here, aren't they? So, you know, I, I think they could go back and, and do something. You know, that's why I always felt so bad for Bab 5, Babylon 5, because so many of that, that cast have gone, yeah, you yeah. know, and that show had a bad run. You know, and, and they never put the money into it that they should have done. And it was a great show with a sparky, spunky, you know, good cast. You know, and that show never had the budget to show what it should have done. It was groundbreaking for a time, but it got it became old very quickly. And, and they never supported it like they should have done. And now most of them are gone, like I say, so they can't do it. And, and it's not a show I'd want to see recast with new actors. That was one of those shows that worked with the cast that it had. But I think with something like Enterprise... You know, like I say, unless I'm, something's dropped out of my head, they're all still around, mm. you know, and, and you could do something. In this Netflix era, you know, you make a great point, Rob. They don't give the figures, but they've made it very clear that DS9 now gets way more viewers than it ever got back in the day on on the network, back when it was, you know, out there in syndication, you know, with the other shows. Way more people watch it on Netflix because it was so it's so imminently bingeable because of that arc, you know, not that I think they'll ever do a DS9 season eight. And where's our Blu-rays? Season, you know oh. what we're left behind, sort of thing. Or, you know that that the documentary, but you know they could. Yeah, I mean they don't even have to do a 
a live action TV show. When I watched that, what was the what's the documentary? What we leave behind? The DS9 well, yeah, yeah. What we leave behind? When, yeah. When, yeah. When, yeah. When yeah. When they're showing yeah. the, um, you know, the first episode of season, series eight, and they were using you know concept artwork, that mm. kind of thing. I was, I was, I was, I was well into that. I was like really into yeah. the story. Um, yeah. I mean, when you when you if you've ever played the game The Old Republic, you know, um, and you see some of the introductions that they do to the Star Wars to the, to yes. uh, the Old Republic. No, it's incredible. I always wonder why why have we never seen um, a Star Wars or a Star Trek show in that style? You know, or even or less. You could even dial it back even more and say, let's just have a big finish um, kind of audio drama yeah. with all the Enterprise crew. I would love that. That would be amazing. I'm, I'm really surprised yeah. that they haven't got bored with that and just or, or the DS9 cast because when you when you interview the DS9 cast, or you see them being interviewed, they all, most of them all say, oh, I'd love to carry on doing more. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, I, I, I sometimes wonder if it's the way that the franchise is managed, that, you know, they don't realise what they're sitting on sometimes, and they can do so much more with it. Have they ever? I wonder, have they ever? I mean, DS9 is, I mean, we, we're biased, Rob, you and me, because it's our favourite show. So we, we would absolutely, we'd give... Body parts to see more, more of those characters. You've got the novels, action. though. Look at those <laughs> novels that came yeah. out in the wake of it. They were actually pretty <laughs> damn good. Yeah. 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 But DS9 was the one that, that put a bow in it, didn't it? I mean, it really did. You know, Kira and, and Jake at the at the window, at the portal, as the camera falls away, you know, they'd really wrap that show up nicely. Next Gen led into Generations quite smartly. You know, Enterprise, I think, which, which wasn't my favourite show by any measure, but I think Enterprise got jipped, and I think there's, there's definitely scope to do something more with Enterprise. Voyager even kind of wrapped up its own story, and you know, um, to a degree. Yeah. I feel like a short change on Voyager as well, but that's a whole new, whole different. Well, we just should have come home halfway through season seven. That's what this. Yes, is. yes. When you get a whole episode saying goodbye to Neelix, but then you get ten minutes of the end seeing the Voyager just flying towards Earth, you feel short changed. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much exactly the same. What happened? There was it Alien Resurrection. I always thought there was a a bit of a Voyager rip. Let's just go towards Earth, and you see all these seating shots of them heading there, and then end credits. Like, <laughs> yeah, you kind of like you there's wanted. A whole, there's a there's a whole podcast there because they were teasing Alien Earth War, weren't they? Oh, they, they were. The were they, Earth, how, so. how long in the Dark Horse comics they always said we're going to go there, we're going to go there, and particularly that trailer for even Alien Three had that. You yeah, know? and of course, no, nah, we're not going there. It was going to be at one stage, uh, a, was it a, a, a monk's uh, seminary in oh, yeah. space, you know? Yeah, yeah. Try so many different times. But you guys are 100% right. Each time I feel they've ended a series, apart from probably Voyager had a better chance of it, but every other one, I think even TNG to a certain extent, wasn't um, the sort of ending that we wanted. We wanted something to continue. And um, TNG was the only one, because it was the granddaddy there for those ones in that generation to really spread out to the stars. Got you obviously had generations. So it's interesting mm. to see what they'll do um, with others coming out. With Strange uh, New Worlds, for example, that's going to be tying right into the original series and how they sort of circumvent, do we get Kirk in that season? There's a question. I mean, I mean, I mean, just stepping back to ne next gen, we we had the, the beautiful advantage at the time of knowing enough that that they were filming Generations, the Kirk and Scotty and Chekhov stuff before they'd finished filming All Good Things, and I think they had I don't know I think they had three weeks off or something or three days off, three somethings off, not long from going from one you know, from All Good Things into Generations, they pretty much went straight into it. So it's a bit of a slog for the actors, um, but all uh, but uh, Strange New Worlds. Yeah, I mean, let let's get somebody cast as Kirk. Let's just do it. I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna find somebody who looks like William Shatner. Chris Pine doesn't look particularly like William Shatner, but there's enough of him. There's enough of the Shatner about him that it works in that film. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them is pretty well cast. There's enough of the spirit of the of the actors, and it is like I said earlier, it's the actors as much as the characters. You know um, that that works. So yeah, let's get another Kirk. Let's get a younger Kirk. You know, let let's do it. Go for it. I think it's I think it's going to be awesome. That show, like like with Star Trek, I'm looking forward to the Cassian Andor show more than any of the others. I just that's the one that's lighting me up. I think it's going to be an, an amazing show because it's leading us into Star Wars, and this is leading us into the original series. I think it could be something really special. Nice. 
What are you looking forward to about it, Rob? Um, uh, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I'm keeping my expectations low because when I do, I generally enjoy it more. Um, I've done, I, you know, I've done that with. Um, uh, I did that with the Mandalorian um, going in. I thought, well, you know, the first season was great. Will the second season be any better? And so I had low expectations going in, and thankfully I've enjoyed the the first episode. But I'm not watching the second. That's tonight. But um, no, I, I just want to. Uh, I wanted to keep my expectations in check, and um, let's just wait and see. As long as, as long as if they do bring Kirk in, that he, he is Kirk and not some. Um, Biggie Two-Shoe Kirk. You know, I still want to see the Kirk that he was in the original series. Um, what when he sees Kirk? I want to see, I want to see the, you know, you know, a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a ladies' man kind of thing, you know, let's, let's still have that, you know. I know it's not politically popular these days, but I want to see Kirk as Kirk. I don't want to see him as a, uh, as a, as a modern interpretation of Kirk. I want to see him as he was. Yeah, 100% agree with that. What would he be on? It would be on the USS Farragut. At that stage, it would have been, wouldn't it? Yeah, Farragut was his was his command. Was it his? No, he was under Captain Garth. Was he on the on the Farragut? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was. Yeah, Farragut was his first ship. Yeah, that'd be interesting because I don't know how far ahead of, of the original series this is set. Um, I don't think it's too far, is it? So within six or seven years, I would say. Yeah, it's not quite 10 years, it's like a little bit shorter than that, so it might be, yeah, seven years or something. Yeah, so, yeah, there's some serious scope there to, yeah, as long as they're not too cute too cute about it, you know, they did a great job with Harry Mudd sort of sort of doing an adaptation of him, so you, you knew it was Harry, but it, you know, it evoked, you know, uh, the original performance from back in the day, but, but that, that, performance of mud wouldn't either stylistically fit now or quite work so to put a twist on it was was yeah you know, it was quite clever uh, that's that's what i think they can do because obviously you know the ship looks more amazing now the sets are better blah 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 you know there's more money spent in catering now than they spent on the show back then so you know that's that's that is what it is but um i totally agree with rob you know you look at the, hey, i'll give you an example Star Trek Into Dark is my least favourite Star Trek film for many reasons, and it should have been one of my favourites, but it wasn't. There's a scene that got all the criticism where the producers apologised, and I, I, I get more irritated by the apology than anything else when um, Carol Marcus is on the ship and she, she's getting changed and she says to Kirk, don't look, and Kirk goes, OK, so he, turns, so he sits behind the, the chair or whatever, and then, of course, Kirk looks, and because Kirk looks, we look, because we see what Kirk sees, because Kirk's a horny 60s guy, and she's a hot blonde, and why wouldn't Captain Kirk look at a hot blonde getting changed? Because he's Captain Kirk, and, you know, that's you look at the original series, and that's kind of what the show is, you know, is part of the show. I want to see that, and if you want to sort of highlight how right or wrong that was, do that via other characters, not by changing him. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the back, the backdrop to his actions can, can highlight whether they were right or wrong, but don't change him. Because if you change him, like Rob says, all of a sudden he's not Captain Kirk anymore. He's, he's like, now we are in another alternate reality, you know, because that's not how Kirk was was sort of how he was. And it was written in the 60s. It was a different world. Look at Mad Men. It's a different... Everything was different. I just hope they... They don't have to batter us over the head with it, but I hope they honour that to a degree and have other characters sort of go... Pfft. You know what I mean? It's There's ways of playing it without completely disrupting what the original character was about because he was a product of his time. The time it was written, not not the 22nd century, but the, the character when it was written. I think they should sort of stick to that to a degree. Oh, I agree, 100%. And give us this time a proper Scotty that's Scottish. Right-o. <laughs> 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 oh, well, James doing alone. He's oh, I wasn't talking about doing. I was talking about that one that's in uh, the JJ films trying to do Scottish. Yeah, uh, you write, on paper you'd think Simon Pegg would make a, a superb Scotty, wouldn't you? They should have got he that. He wasn't bad. He yeah. wasn't bad. He's all right, isn't he? Yeah, he's very much his own sort of version of it, but yeah, I'd rather he was there than not, but I totally take your point. And do, I think, yeah, it'd be nice it's to, to get close, but yeah, good old Jimmy Doing did a great job. It's got to be, that one's got to be more of a, a version of 
Duan's version of a Scottish character than actually a Scottish character. It, that makes any sense. It's funny that JJ's own, what was it, his um, first assistant director or the AD or whatever, who is Scottish, he you know, I even thought about it, Simon Pegg as Scotty, you know, he even said it himself, he's like, it doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like if it's, if it's coming from a Scotsman, you know it can't work. This is an alternative timeline. Let's go all Futurama and have Welshie. Nice, <laughs> nice. Good idea. Let's hear your best. Let's hear your best, Scotty <laughs> Rob. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. Well, we're gonna <laughs> go on. Go on. Sorry. No, it's all right, no. I was just going to do some dodgy brownie accent, but I just, I bailed out. <laughs> 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 all right, folks, we're coming to an end of the episode here, and I just want to thank both, obviously, Mark and Rob for being on. But before we do that, i also got to ask them to let you know how you can follow them on their platforms and keep in touch and follow all the Star Trek goodness that they do. Rob, where can the people find you? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at Welsh Slider. Um, I also run the Bearded Trio, so they can find the Bearded Trio on Facebook and Twitter and all the other social media platforms. Awesome. And Mark, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me at Prefects underscore Timing on Twitter uh, and online at Fantatrax, uh, Star Wars news site. And I also write for Star Wars magazine, which is good fun. So uh, you can find my stuff over there. There's a really cool article about the Star Wars holiday special knocking around at the moment, which. Uh, I, I would say this, but yeah, I think it was, it was a good fun read So and fun to research. So yeah, out there, usually noodling around talking nonsense like I have today. <laughs> <laughs> and a big thanks to all of you out there listening tonight. I hope you enjoy it. Share the episode out. Let people know about it. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts. Get out there and let them know what you think of the show. Be generous. Give us five stars. But if not, give us some feedback on what you'd like to see on the show and what a... Uh, We do have our deep dives in Star Trek and vice versa. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode, episode number 12, looking at another era of Star Trek. I'm Adam O'Brien, along with Mark and Rob. We'll catch you next time here on Making Treks, a Star Trek fan podcast. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. We like to continue to feed your ears by inviting you to listen to the Fandom Podcast Network and all of the other awesome shows we have to offer. It starts with our flagship show, Culture Clash, our weekly pop culture news podcast. Blood Kings, our Highlander podcast. Couch Potato Theater, our podcast celebrating our favorite movies. Time Warp, the Fandom Flashback podcast discussing a year in movies and our favorite pop culture topics. Enzo, the NFL podcast. Good evening, an Alfred Hitchcock podcast. Union Federation, our Star Trek and Orville podcast. Hair Metal, the 80s and early 90s rock metal podcast. Type 40, our Doctor Who podcast. Lethal Mullet, a 1980s and 90s action film podcast. What a Piece of Junk, a Star Wars podcast. And our newest show, Making Treks, a new Star Trek podcast with a deep dive into the final frontier with host Mark Newbold and Adam P. O'Brien. You can enjoy all of these great Fandom Podcast Network shows on our master feed at fpnet.podbean.com. Fandom Podcast Network is also on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. You can also find us on Facebook under Fandom Podcast Network. You can also email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter under Fandom Podcast Network. Thank you for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom.